Divine Truth Documentary Jesus, Mary and Others provide information to people or organizations that produce documentaries. In this video, Jesus and Mary are interviewed by Thomas Leder while visiting a local botanical garden. This is session 9, filmed on the 15th of August 2013 in Badrim, Queensland, Australia. I feel quite relaxed today, actually. Oh, I feel like we've... Uh, broken the back of it. We've covered quite a lot. <laughs> From the perspective of... And I had to hone myself back in. Yeah. yeah. Um, because it's impossible to... Answer. That's a kookaburra. Oh, is it? Yeah. Hopefully like they'll have... Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's how they sound. Almost like a monkey. <laughs> Isn't the sounds lovely? And that's a yeah. butcher bird. Yeah. Singing. And there was a whip bird resident coming out of the river. There you go. Like that. That's a butcher bird. <laughs> yeah. Cool. It's nice, huh? It's uh, beautiful. It's nice, a nice way to finish off our mm. trip, I think. Yeah. Mm. It's just a different part of Australia as well, isn't it? Mm. Different landscape. Mm. Okay, you ready, sorry? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, sound wise, okay? Sounds great. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay, so what is divine truth? Yeah, so the second most important question in the universe to ask what is divine truth? Divine truth is God's truth, God's universal truth, and it in incorporates everything mathematical, everything scientific, everything that is absolutely the truth. So it incorporates the absolute truth about you, the absolute truth about me, the absolute truth about the world in which we live, the absolute truth about God, the absolute truth of God's laws. All of these things are all incorporated in divine truth. And it doesn't include anything that we think is true, but from God's perspective is definitely not true. So, you know, and I would, I would classify things like religious truth is not necessarily divine truth. It could be, but many times is not. And it involves finding out the absolute truth about everything. And of course, because it's infinite in its nature, because God's infinite in his nature, it means that we're never going to discover it all. We will always be searching for more truth. All the rest of our existence, we'll never know it all. And, the, and people who believe that they're going to know it all, in the end will come to be surprised perhaps, but there is no way of ever knowing it all. And if God is infinite in, in his nature and the universe that God's created is infinite in its nature and ever expanding, then it makes sense logically that you're never going to discover all the things you could discover in the universe. But we can work towards it. We can, we can have this engagement with God where, where we start discovering a lot more and a lot more rapidly. And, uh, and so we're not limited in our discoveries of divine truth, but it is something we're going to be discovering for the rest of our existence. It's not something that is fixed in its nature in terms of, no one on earth can ever say, I know all of God's truth. No book on, on earth can ever say, this is the only truth of God. So, you know, when people claim the Bible is God's word, well, no, it's not God's word. It might be a portion of God's word, it might be a portion of the divine truth. And I would su suggest to people that it's actually just a small portion of divine truth, but the divine truth is much larger than that. It's universal in its nature. Yeah. What would you add to that, uh, Mike? Just that it's very common on Earth today to believe that there is no one truth, that, that the truth for you is different f to the truth for me. And basically there is one truth about every situation. We may not... And everything. And everything mm. and every creation and every um, event we may not see it clearly because we we are affected by what's inside of us in the way we perceive those things but it is possible to know the truth about things if we connect to god and develop that relationship ultimately because god knows the truth the single truth about 
the event or the person or ourselves, mm. if we sincerely engage this relationship with God, it is possible to begin to receive some of God's truths about what is happening, about where we live, about who we are. But also the very observation of the universe around us by, by actually placing ourselves within the universe around us, we automatically change the observation of truth as well, unfortunately. So, so from God's perspective, the truth is everything that's going on, even how our own observation affects our, our, the results of our observations. You know? so, so even from that perspective, God has a far better and far clearer knowledge of how we affect the universe in which we live. And, uh, and that is also divine truth. We can discover it, again, from God generally, but from, for most people, they don't engage their process with God, and so they go through an experimental process of discovering truth. So most science, scientists on the planet are going through experimental processes, discovering new scientific truths, for example. You could engage God in the process and find a lot more scientific truths. And in fact, many of the very famous scientists historically, such as ones like Einstein and Newton and ones like that, did have that bent towards having a, some kind of relationship with God and as a result oftentimes discovered truths that were ahead of their time as a result of that relationship. But that is something like there is no, I feel, no discrepancy between God's absolute truth and the universe that surrounds us. I feel where, when there is a discrepancy, what it means is that particular thing is not truth, quite simply. And uh, because every single thing that ever happens and ever that we can ever observe will have an absolute truth about it. And if we see it uh, as one thing and yet eventually science or mathematics or, some, or physics determines that it's something else and, and, and can prove that, then we've got to give up our false belief because in the end what we believe was false and what science or mathematics or physics has discovered about it is true. But, but there is a lot more to discover, physics with physics, science and mathematics, than has been discovered. And, uh, and all of those things, all, even the undiscovered things, are all divine truth, God's truth. Yeah. Excellent. So do we ask the most important question? Yeah. Well? <laughs> I'll ask that question. Yeah. So what do you believe is the most important question? The most important question a person could ever ask is what is divine love? What is God's love? Because without God's love, God's truth can't even be experienced beyond a certain point. So, so the two most important questions, the first one is what is God's love and how do I receive it is probably a part of that. And then the second most important question is what is God's truth? and how do I discover it, is a part of that. So if we ask the question, what is God's love? Well, God's love is a feeling, an emotion inside of God that God transmits to people specifically, to human souls that God has created, God's children. And it has the effect of being able to transform the soul from a standard human, if you like, a person who has a limited capacity to understand, a limited capacity to feel, a limited capacity to take in knowledge, a limited capacity to grow, to a person who has an unlimited capacity to feel, an unlimited capacity to gain knowledge, an unlimited capacity to grow. So it has this transformational effect upon the human soul once it's received. And for that reason, it's one of the most important things that a person could engage. Receiving God's love is, is the most important thing that we can do to improve our quality of life, our happiness, and also our discovery of truth, our discovery of absolute truth. So um, that, to me, is the most important question a person can ask and the most important endeavour that a person can engage. All other things are dependent upon that. All other things can be discovered if you know that. The whole universe is built upon it. It's like the whole, it's the foundation of the entire universe, in fact. And so without understanding love, God's love in particular, we will not understand many things in the universe. So we can experience we can experience them, we can experiment with them, but in the end we won't understand them until we understand love, until we understand God's love in particular, and, and have actually received some of God's love. And that enables us to understand all of these things that are normally not well understood. So to me that's the most important endeavour a person could engage, 
like receiving God's love. And the second, uh, and linked to that, is finding God's truth, which is, a, which is a, an everlasting, eternal endeavour uh, that the average person can engage if they wish to, but that's dependent upon their will. And then I feel there are many other things that we could do that we'll talk about that are linked to those two things, but they're the, mo the two most important subjects you could ever discuss and ever discover. Okay, sorry. <clears throat> Is it possible if just we go into, into yeah, I know. if we I go know. into if I'm we go into the how yeah into the how of receiving God's love yeah definitely yeah. that's easy mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah yeah that's really easy okay next experiment Tom yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we're probably that's what we're encouraging mostly is is that yeah. Yeah. yeah and it's really the basis of your entire relationship with God like. God communicates through, through love. love. Mm. Uh, all colours of the rainbow. Of yeah. If you get a shot of them. Every one of them is like a rainbow. Oh, yeah. They've got yeah. red, purple, blue, green. green, beautiful, yellow. Why does why do cameramen do that? Like if you hear birds, then they're like, we've got to get a shot of the bird. Cut Is that away. so you can cut away to the bird and go, oh, there's the birdies. Yeah, there. so if there's a plane going past, you can cut away maybe, you can yeah. get away to it or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Okay, you guys are happy. Yeah. So how can you how can you work towards receiving God's love? Well, that, I suppose, is the most important question that a human could ask about themselves. Because without God's love, it's impossible to infinitely grow. So it's a very important question to ask. The answer to it is very, very simple. All you need to do is have a desire for it. And there goes our cooker buttons. You hear them? <laughs> they sound yeah. funny, don't they? We've got families of them at home, and you would have, oh, you wouldn't have, yeah. They're quite a big bird, hey? They're, they're very, like very big yeah. bird. Yeah. And they sometimes just break out like that, where one <laughs> of them starts, and another one starts, and another one starts, and all of a sudden, <laughs> they're off, you know. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, if we go again. So, I just continue. Yeah, so, um, the most important question we can ask is how can I personally receive God's love? And the answer is very, very simple, actually. You've got to have a pure desire for it. That's all you need, a pure desire to receive it. And the pure desire can't be manufactured. It can't be something that's fake. It can't be a facade. It has to be real. It has to be a feeling that exists within you. Now, to have a feeling to receive God's love, generally you have to also have a feeling that God possibly exists. Otherwise, you won't have a feeling to receive any love from the being that doesn't exist. Also, you would have to have a feeling that God is an entity of some form rather than just an energy field. Because love is a feeling that's transmitted from one being to another. And God's love, obviously, is a feeling of love transmitted from God to the human soul. So you would have to develop some kind of desire to receive the love. And as a result of developing a desire, you can receive it. Every single person who has ever lived and will ever live can choose to receive it. But many don't, unfortunately, for lots of different reasons. Most of them belief systems that they have that are out of harmony with receiving it. But it is the most important thing that you can receive for your entire future. Because without it, infinite growth is not possible. So we can only grow to a certain extent by relying on our development of our own love. But, but beyond that point, beyond what's called the sixth dimension or sixth sphere, you can't grow any further. You, can't, you can only have sideways sort of experiences, you know, where you go from one experience to the other experience to the other experience, but you're not actually growing in love after that point. Whereas when you receive God's love, you've got the ability to continue growing because God's love is infinite, God is infinite, God's love is infinite. When you, you receive it, you're transferred from being a potentially finite being the human, to an infinite being, the human soul turning into something that's divine, something that God, a true child of God, if you like. 
and that's the process that we're encouraging people to experiment with. As for, with everything, we want to experiment with them. We don't, don't just believe what people say to you, experiment with it, see whether it's possible. And with regard to receiving divine love, there's many experiments we can do. You know, we can even ask questions of truth while we're receiving divine love. And there's experiments that can be done there as well to determine what is true and what is not. And these are all things I feel that the basic message of divine truth that we taught in the first century has been sort of lost in a lot of ways. Because essentially um, receiving God's love, that's what forms the basis of our relationship with God. God communicates with love. And so unless we, and it is an emotional experience, many people base their faith around intellectual beliefs and having thoughts towards God when actually the true way that we can grow and come to know God is by opening our hearts to receiving God's love. So a lot of what we talk to people about is reaching a state where they feel open towards God and allowing God to change their hearts. So this relationship with God is not dependent upon religious dogma. It's not dependent upon rules that, that people on earth have established as how to have a relationship with God. It is dependent upon laws that God established, absolute truths that God established. It's not dependent on what people believe, it's dependent on what God knows. And so we need to also understand, with regard to the reception of divine love, that, that we can't receive divine love unless we start accepting what God knows, unless we start accepting divine truth. And it, unless we start living in harmony with the love that we've received, we will not receive more. So we need to also come to understand that just because we're a part of one religious faith, it doesn't mean that another religious faith, people in that faith haven't received God's love. The reality is there's people of all walks of life around the world today who have received God's love. And all sorts of different religions, people of all sorts of different religions. There are, there are Muslims, there are Christians, there are Hindus, there are atheists even who have received some divine love because it's about their soul feeling, not their intellectual thoughts. So you, you can actually have, right at this moment, a different soul feeling than an intellectual thought. And it's, uh, God's relationship with us is based on soul-to-soul -soul relationship. Remember, in terms of the creation of the human, your body is not you. Your spirit body is not you. Your soul is you. And that's the thing that can develop a relationship with God. The real you develops the relationship. And that is through feelings, emotions, experiences, through knowledge that comes through, not just from uh, somebody telling you something, but something that you've personally experienced. And a lot of times we, we think that um, our personal experience um, means certain things, but, but we're often not fully analytical about our personal experiences. So there's many people who are of the Christian faith, for example, who have received divine love, received God's love, and they assume it's because they are Christian. And then there's many people who are Muslim who have received God's love, and they assume it's because they are Muslim. Right? And there are many people of all sorts of belief systems on earth that have received God's love, and they assume that it's because they have that belief system that, that they've received God's love, and it's not. It's only because they had a pure desire at some point to receive it, that they received it. And God is not worried about man-made you know, ideals or laws or principles or, or religious thought. God is only concerned with us finding out and discovering the absolute truth. So, so and, and God will give love to any person who longs for it, no matter what their walk of life, no matter what their religious background, no matter what their culture, no matter what their uh, racial uh, background, no matter what their sexual orientation, God will give love to a person who sincerely asks. And that's probably one of the most powerful things to know about God, that God wants to love all of God's children and does love all of God's children. And it's only us that limit how much of that love we can receive. What were you going to say? I was going to add, God does love all of us, but it's only <coughs> mm. based upon our, how willing we are to receive that love. Yeah. That you say it's yeah. yeah. Okay, so thank you. Gee, it's a nice day. Yes, yeah. yeah. lovely. You know, with regard to divine love, like it's, it's the very first experiment that can have a positive 
impact upon your life in a very short time. And and that's why I'm surprised most people don't engage the experiments regarding it. You know, In the spirit world, what we do is we encourage people to go, if there is a God, and if you exist, and if, if you've got love me. to give me, then can I have some, please? <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Um, because a lot of times you can receive God's love even if you don't know whether God exists. Just by having a longing to try and experiment about it, you can receive it. So and most people are not aware of that. So they, th they think they have to have a sp specific belief system before something happens. Or that their lifestyle has to measure up to a certain set of rules Ideal. or standards. And that's not the case. God really desires to have a relationship, a very personal relationship with every single one of the children. And um, Eventually, there will be standards in that relationship, but only standards that God has shown you are the wisest and most happy way to live your life through that relationship. It's not because some man on earth has gotten the rule book called the, you know, the tablet of the Ten Commandments, for example, and started listing them down. And, and obviously something like the Ten Commandments has no relationship to God whatsoever, actually, because the, the first four or five of those commandments relating to God's jealousy and God's wrath and so forth, those things don't exist. God doesn't have any of those things. So, so they, they are just a man-made, again, a man-made or a spirit-made rule book that people then have followed. God's not like that either. God, God knows the truths of the universe and God's not going to bend them for anybody else. So, there's the kookaburra again. I think you've got it in there. I think that was okay. Yeah. I, think, I quite like the sounds of... Yeah. yeah. The Australian yeah. bush sounds are great. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, you actually answered a question about the experiment, which I wrote down. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, was that all, you got that all good, yeah? Yeah, it just came in right at the end, in the last word. No, did you get the start of it? Start, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, um, we didn't say go, did we? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Got a bit back on track. Back on track. Because I thought about the mind and the way that... Because only a proportion... It says that only a proportion we actually only use. A small, yeah. amount. a small amount. Well, another important question is probably prayer. What is prayer? And yeah. you know, like, prayer is one of the most important things a person can engage, but they have to know what it is. Mm. Like, most people believe prayer is like, you know, saying, Our Father, right in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. You know, that's not a prayer. That's just a heap of statements that we've s s strung together from an intellectual perspective, it's not a prayer. And for most people, it doesn't touch their soul at all. It doesn't touch their heart at all. And so if it doesn't touch their heart, they're not connecting with God. When we approach prayer with a sense of duty uh, or obligation or this is something I must do or this is something I must say, a certain set of words I must say, that's actually not an authentic prayer. God can't hear that prayer or feel in actual fact God feels our prayers mm. and we feel the return we feel the love in return mm. and um, so it's possible to say a set of words um, as but long as there's they must be accompanied sense. by mm. a very heartfelt longing even for God's love to enter us and to change us and to teach us mm. yeah yeah you gotta be Stuff in the foreground, then pull the paper to it. you get in? Yeah. I think we are recording. So, why did you choose Australia to come back to? Well, as you know, there are 14 or 7 soul pairs, 14 people who chose to come back to the earth. And of those soul pairs, the first pair chose Australia, and that's myself and Mary. The second pair chose Australia, that was John, the Apostle John and his soulmate. And then the third pair chose Vietnam, so Asia. The fourth pair chose Australia. The fifth pair chose Africa. And the sixth pair chose North America. And the seventh pair chose South America. So the 14 are all spread all over the earth. In terms of the reasons why we personally chose Australia, well, there's probably quite a lot of those. Firstly, 
we wanted a place where we could process through our emotions uh, under where we weren't under a huge amount of stress from everybody doing it. And of course in Australia there's a lot of space, so that meant that we could find a place like we have now, like a 40 acre place, and, and work our way through emotions without anybody, uh, our neighbours getting too stressed about what's going on. <laughs> Secondly, um, there is uh, quite a lot of freedom of both religion and thought here. Sorry, you are right. I'm good, I'm good, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Good. Yeah, it's all right. Me, yeah. I'll just punch in a bit now. It's fine. I was just checking on the ninja. It's all yeah. Good. All right. Um, yeah, so there's quite uh, a lot of freedom of religion here in Australia, quite a lot of freedom of thought here as well. So there is a tolerance, a, a, a definitely tolerance from different people, including different religions. Like if we did what we were doing, say, in America at the moment, where 70% of them are Christian, and very, very militant, some of them, then it might not be as safe to do some of the things we're currently doing if, if we grew up in that environment. And in other environments, we also wanted to choose environments where we would survive to adulthood. And one of the 14 have been murdered, but, but the rest of the 14 are still alive. So um, most of the 14 have survived until adulthood and therefore it's given us the best chance to teach divine truth as as possible, assuming the different ones of the fourteen decide to do that, and that is their decision. They don't they're not forced into making a decision by God, or or you know I'm not trying to push them into making a decision. It's up to them what they choose to do. But generally, we came to Australia for a lot of different reasons, mostly to assist us through this process of change, which eventually we hope to complete at some point in the future. Um, and get in the condition, the right condition, to demonstrate divine truth in, in as an example. And, uh, and of course, you need a good an environment that allows that to occur. It's no good growing up in an environment that's hostile, um, because it makes it very much more difficult for for this kind of change to occur. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to pick up on something that uh, when we when we were leaving Brisbane. Um, and I spoke to AJ about, in the car, we spoke to AJ about how he felt when we passed that car accident. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Mm-hmm. So, I guess, I guess my question is to you, Mary. Um, what did you feel was actually happening at the moment when we passed that accident? Uh, when we drove past the accident, I could just feel that the accident had just very recently happened. And there was a lot of um, panic. In, in everyone present and as we got closer we could see a lot of people actually trying to help the person out of the car and and their their panic actually became quite palpable and the fear in the situation and so I just felt a lot of compassion for what was going on I felt that it was a life-threatening situation for the person in the car and so I was just praying for everyone involved to um, be able to to think clearly, to be present and to know that they didn't need to be so much in a panic and also for the soul of the person in the car just that they also were able to feel um, some love coming towards them, that they could feel calmer and for, yeah, for the best thing possible for them to happen at that time. I don't know what that was and um, I don't know if, if they passed or if they if they stayed here on earth for a bit longer um, but so I was just praying for everyone involved I'm sorry I'm sort of dotting, dotting it's amazing how much okay. panic there was there actually wasn't yeah it? it was very palpable I felt the fear of everyone and it, mm. when people are in that much fear it's it's very hard for love to be present for the person in the car for and now we're and actually finished up rocking back and forth the vehicle and if if the person in the was vehicle injured. was injured with a spinal injury that would have actually caused them even more damage and things like that. And yet it was quite obvious that they were going to have to cut the person out of the vehicle. But there was so much panic in the people trying to help them that, um, you know, they could have finished up doing more damage actually to the person. So it's a bit sad that we get into a panic because we're so afraid of death, right? That's the main reason why we're panicked, because we're afraid of death. And yet death is not anywhere near the experience that everybody believes it to be. It's nowhere near as traumatic as everybody believes. 
And it's not and as in, final as everybody believes. Exactly. <laughs> and in some instances, the process of passing is, is so built up. In, like Most people feel that they have no idea what happens. Even if they have a certain idea or a hope that this is what might happen when I pass, and it might be related to their religious faith or a near-death experience that they had, a lot of people still carry a lot of fear around the idea of passing or someone else passing. Hmm. And um, part of my prayer is to help people know that even passing is not... It's actually often less traumatic than being involved in an accident where everyone is panicking, everyone, no one is actually present or reassuring. Mm. Because actually there's a lot of spirits around us in situations like that who wish to provide reassurance and wish to provide love and care and help people make good decisions for that person. But when everyone's in a state of panic and fear, it's impossible for those spirits to help as well. Mm. Um, do you want to talk about that sign that I saw on the wall? Oh, I have a Thomas sign. Yeah. Um, if you want to talk about it, I'd have you talk about it. <laughs> I, think, I think, though, my personal opinion is that um, we can't, from one experiment, get answers, generally. We, we have to try more than one. And when there is a a tendency for something to be a potentially coincidence the best thing to do is to see another do another experiment and if another coincidence happens at the same time then you start going well yes there's two coincidences in a row when I did the experiment that's a bit strange you know three four five six and by the seventh eighth you're starting to go yeah there's something up here right and I sort of feel like you can't um, make presumptions of single based experiments and and in fact I, I generally per personally avoid those kind of presumptions because I, I know from my own personal experience that it often takes more than that to determine a truth about something. I think a lot of people want to read into those particular things quite significant events and oftentimes they are significant events that are manipulated by spirits around you uh, as well just to prove a point or show you something. Or open you or sometimes. Or open you open somehow. Open you to another possibility. Yeah. Yeah. But, that, but, but there are so many uh, things that could be rather than just uh, God giving you a sign. Does that make sense? And often, uh, sometimes our spirit guides do use signs to help alert us to things, to open us to things, to make us mm. reconsider things. But signs are not the basis of God's communication with us. Mm. As we've said before, the basis of God's communication with us is love. So the, the, feelings, great, the feelings the, that flow between God and ourselves. Yeah. yeah, so the greatest experiments you can do with God involve your feelings. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. We, we have friends that are, uh, that are always looking for signs. You know, the people that we've met that are always looking for signs. There's one lady we know, she, whenever she sees three or four twos together, that means that she's got to see something and it always means that she's got to see something and it always means that she sees something of course but but it's a, it's amazing how frequently she sees four twos together you know <laughs> like all the time everywhere and a lot of times she doesn't even know what she's meant to see in that <laughs> spot, in that, that time does that make sense and and I sort of feel like well that's a bit pointless in a way like it's one thing to have a sign where a spirit friend is showing you a sign but but then at the end of the day, what's the point of it? There's got to be some underlying reason for such things occurring. And, and if you don't know what they are, then it's fairly pointless watching the sign and not knowing anything else other than, oh, there's another sign, there's another sign. So um, I feel quite strongly that while God does provide signs to us, and so do our spirit friends often provide signs to us, um, when it comes to determining the truth of God's existence or the tr universal truth, there's got to be more substantial evidence that will provide that, that truth to you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, what's that? Yeah, we'll give it. Just making sure. We we had we had Mary talking about you being some sort of, well, not being like the sex addict and all that. We haven't. <laughs> I'm not sure we actually have you saying that, um, but I guess it's kind of... <laughs> <laughs> Dude. Of why you're with me. 
Yes, yeah, just for the sex, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing too well with that no. front sometimes. Maybe we that. should do that because we're you together. Sure. Yeah? Yeah, that's I'm fine. just trying to think of a question, mate. Yeah, that's what Thomas was oh, like. You were sex, hey? uh, okay. Thomas was like, just talk about it. Yeah. I don't know what to say. Oh, okay. Um, uh, yeah. well, could you ask something like, um, why did you choose Mary? Or something like that. And you'll be, able to, talk, you'll be able to talk about a lot of things in that. Didn't you just choose me? See, that's a pretty attacking question. That Thomas wouldn't like that. Because you didn't choose me. You don't have a choice, you poor. Yeah. Don't have a choice. I don't think I'm a poor thing, though, yeah. as man. Yeah, well, see, and then you'll say all but... that as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Like God, God made Mary the other half of myself. So whether I accept that or not is really my choice. I, you know, I can accept that, that she is the other half of myself, the truth of that. Or I can ignore it. I can choose to have relationships with other people if I wanted to do so. I didn't want to do that. So five years before I met Mary, oh, I was celibate. And, and I just wanted to only have a relationship with my soulmate. And as soon as I saw Mary, I knew who she was. And I knew she was my, my girl that I'd been looking for for quite a, a number of years before then. Um, but I could also feel that Mary was upset from a breakup of a previous relationship, that she was uncertain about what she was going to do with her future. Uh, I didn't tell her that I felt she was my soulmate. I thought, you know, that's not good for me to do that when she was in a, a fair bit of personal pain, or what I felt was a fair bit of personal pain at the time. And, well, Mary probably wishes that I had said something at the time, at, at times. Um, I didn't say anything because I felt that, you know, it was up to her to work through any issues of attraction or, or lack of it or any of those kind of things. And so we have had a relationship where basically I honour Mary's right to express her will at all times. So that means that if she doesn't want to be with me, I don't try to force her to be with me. But I just say, no worries, darling, you know, go and do your thing, whatever you want to do. And there's been quite a number of times where Mary's gone away for three, four months sometimes um, and then come back, you know. And sometimes in our relationship as well, like I can feel that there's some issues that Mary has with different things. And sometimes I say, well, darling, you know, while we're sleeping together, it's going to be hard for you to deal with that issue. So we should just sleep apart for a while. And, and sometimes we've slept apart up to six months while Mary's worked her way through different issues. And so, how would you characterise my response to, um, to our relationship early on? Which response or, was that? Or how, how did you feel I reacted to Oh, yeah, you were very angry and upset and, and, and often very controlling and trying to always control me and push me around. And, and it took me time to work through all of that and say, OK, this is not really what I wanted but <laughs> you know, my soulmate to, to do, but, but this is where she's at, you know, and, and I had to accept where she was at in terms of her own feelings about relationships and what kind yeah, of Yeah, I had a, I had a lot of um, ideas about what a loving relationship should look like mm. that were actually based on my desire to control, be in control of the man, mm. um, predominantly just of the man, you know. I didn't want to feel vulnerable or exposed or have any expression of myself where I wasn't in control. And I was and pretty I was also... open to... Um to doing what Mary wanted as long as it was harm harmonious with love, right? And sometimes it wasn't, so <laughs> that made yeah. it a bit more difficult. I was also very, I was feeling very um, frightened of how yeah. mm. everyone would respond to me having this relationship, how, how everyone was going to respond to me saying, I think I'm Mary Magdalene, or I'm, I'm having got a lot of confirmation of some experiences here and leading me to come to this acceptance that this is who I am and uh, so I very much wanted AJ to just stop talking about who we were and just get on with teaching divine truth and so a common laugh we've had is that every time somebody asked me a question about being Jesus Mary would get up and get it, ask does anyone want a cup of tea you know like just to, <laughs> just to break the tension yeah. and, and and change the subject that was pretty common yeah often <laughs> other people were more relaxed asking us about who we were than I was yeah. talking about it yeah. 
So in terms of our relationship, like our goal is to just get closer and closer and closer to each other emotionally. So that means we have to deal with any emotional blockages that we may have towards each other and towards even our belief systems, which are out of harmony at times. So, so what we've both got to do, and what we know we've both got to do, because we've done it before, is that we have to choose to accept God's truth over our own desire to stay in our own personal ideas and concepts. And so in that process, I need to exercise my will to choose God's truth, and Mary needs to exercise her will to choose God's truth. But I can't, I don't have control over Mary exercising her will. She's allowed to choose not to. She's allowed to do whatever she wants. And Mary has no control over my will. I'm allowed to do what I want. I'm allowed to choose not to, 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 to accept God's, God's truth either. And so what we're, what we're basically both doing, we both have a very strong desire to, to accept God's truth when we recognise it. And that includes accepting God's truth about ourselves. And so, and so that becomes our primary focus and that's what eventually causes the, uh, what I call the union process, like the process of becoming unified with each other in complete harmony with each other with, in every way. The more we accept the universal truth and God's truth about ourselves, the more we're going to get closer together as a result if we're soulmates. So, and that's what uh, has been happening in our relationship yeah. and will continue to happen until such a time as we have completed the process of, of unification. And, and once the unified process completes, basically Mary will just be a feminine expression of our one soul and I'll be a male expression of our one soul. And, uh, and in fact, anybody who speaks to us will basically get pretty much identical answers with a feminine and a masculine expression of it um, on Which any subject that we know already. the truth about. Yeah. <laughs> So. Often happens already, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 And Quite often people go to Mary and ask her a question and she gives them an answer and they go away going, I don't like that answer. <laughs> and I'll ask AJ, he'll tell me something different. Right? They come up to me and I give them identical, very much the identical answer and sometimes even exact words that Mary gave them, right? And they go away going, I still don't like that answer. <laughs> <laughs> but they sort of expect us to say different things. And many men and women, like it's, many, it's gender based many times. So, so a male might come up to me and ask, uh, ask a question and I give him an answer that he doesn't really like at the time. And so he goes to Mary and he thinks because she's a woman, she'll get, he'll get a different answer from her. And, and Mary often then, and independently gives him the same answer and he goes away. And then he's got to think about it because both of us <laughs> have given the same answer. Um, and we find that happening frequently, don't we, where people try to... Uh, or they believe that we're not as connected to each other as we are and they also have a tendency to believe that I don't know all of Mary's history or Mary doesn't know all of mine and uh, so yeah. Yeah. yeah, people seem to assume that we don't have a like our relationship is very transparent we speak very honestly about our past, about what we're feeling right now about and our desires, our passions, what we want to do in the future um, and the only time I don't mention things to Mary is, Mary, if when, is when Mary tells me not to. <laughs> Basically. And she has done that quite frequently in the past, but less so now. You know, so when we first met, Mary said, don't you tell me anything about me being Mary Madeline? Don't you tell me any what you think are your memories about me in the past? And say so I didn't. <laughs> and, and, uh, and Mary had all these memories come up on her own, of course. And, and then she's going, oh, OK, now I'd probably like to talk about this with you. <laughs> Is that what you remember as well? And I go, yeah, that's exactly what I remember. <laughs> and so, you know, in that regard, we have an independent ex experience. But as we work through our different emotional injuries, uh, we get closer and closer together. So you could say that the independent experience eventually grows into a single experience, basically. And that's what's happening in our life. Excellent, thank you. I just, it might just be easy for you to speak freely if I just give a name and then... Sure. Can... Um, so we spoke with Marion. Marion? Maid Marion, yeah. Marion. Marion. Yeah, Marion. So, so Marion was the lady who was sitting right down the front of my seminar, right in front of me. And uh, she put up, she was the first person to put up her hand and the first person for me to ask, ask a question. 
to she asked me a question, but she didn't really ask a question. She just wanted to make a whole heap of statements. And I could see at the time that she was completely overcloaked by a spirit as well. And and so it was just really a spirit who wanted to make some statements to me. And Marion, I could feel, has a lot of very strong emotions about power. She wants power. She wants glory, attention, approval, but in particular power, like political power even she, she's looking for. And I could feel that's what she was looking for in the room. She wanted the power of control of the whole room, and I wouldn't give it to her. And, uh, and so she got very angry, and he, I got her to stop, basically. And in the process, she became very, very angry, and she projected that rage at me for the entire first half of the the entire first half of the session. So probably an hour and a half of it. And because she was a, a new person, the first time she'd ever been, I sort of allowed that to continue. But um, if she had been there a few times before, I probably wouldn't have. I probably would have sent her home. I would have said, "Look, you're in a rage with me now." And, you know, you're in a hall that I paid for, on a seat that I paid for, listening to a free seminar, and you're still projecting rage at me. That's not very loving. You need to go home. But because she was a first person come, first time, first time she'd, time she'd been there, uh, I, I thought, oh, I'll see where this goes, you know, and just let her do it. And to her own credit, I feel, you know, halfway through that process, she sort of realised what was going on. And she's had problems, I gather, with spirits all of her life. And uh, from what I could feel from her, she's had all sorts of almost psychotic episodes with spirits. And, uh, and her addiction to power is what drives all of these problems. So it, it was beneficial for her to understand some things. So, so I sort of allowed it to continue. And, and, and it did stop about halfway through the presentation. But it is quite difficult putting up with that right standing, sitting right in front of you with a scowling face looking straight at you <laughs> while you're trying to give a seminar about love. <laughs> and, uh, and so, it, you know, if she did it again or a few more times, I think she'd be removed from the audience, actually. Yeah. I feel, I can feel from her, her life has been one of, uh, her child has been one of quite harsh conditions. And as a result, she now just wants power in every situation. And that's her main addiction. And unless she addresses that main addiction, um, she's going to have a very, very hard life, in fact. And I've said that to her. She came up after the event, actually, and the next day and, and said, uh, you know that I was projecting rage at you the whole time? And I said, yes. And I talked to her about why, what, what was the underlying reason why. And, which was this addiction to power that she wasn't getting in the audience. And, and, uh, but she was very resistive to hearing that material, of course. And the spirit with her was very resistive to uh, hearing it as well, her hearing it, because the spirit with her wants power as much as she does. And so, so if oh, she deals with her desire for power, then the spirit will have less control of her. Yeah, and the spirit doesn't want that. So I don't know how well she's going to go with divine truth, to be frank, because it, she's so much addicted to power. And, uh, and you know, eventually if we receive God's truth, we're not addicted to power anymore. So, so it's going to be something she needs to give up if she's ever going to practice the truth herself. Yeah. Um, see, sometimes people, when they hear my opposite perspective to what they think of themselves, they think, oh, there's something major wrong here, right? But then there's other people who, like Jason, who've done that, and then they've gone away and thought about it, and go, yeah, there's something going on here. And given themselves time to process and everything. So what, what I like about Jason, I, we met Jason probably about three years ago, I think, on the Gold Coast is where we first met them. We were doing a seminar and they came to the audience and they'd only just lost their little, lost baby. Their little baby at the time. And, um, and I suppose they were both looking for answers as to the reason why that had happened. Um, and how to deal and with the grief. And how to deal with the grief. I think that was their my, main reason why they probably came along. And we've gotten to know them, of course, since that time a little. Like, we don't spend a huge amount of time with them, but... We've only seen them at seminars. We've seen them at seminars, and, and sometimes there's been uh, working bees that we've had at different people's houses and stuff, and we've gone along and they've gone along, so we've gotten to spend a bit of time with them that way. And there was one uh, working thing down in Kyabra, down in a sheep station that we did as a voluntary effort, you know, about a hundred volunteers went down to help. And he was one of the persons who were driving a supply motorbike around to, so I got to 
catch up with him a fair bit there. So he, he's a very, um, what I would classify to be as a very even tempered man who um, analyzes almost everything that you say, even though he may disagree with it at first. And he's not quick to judgment or to uh, anger or any of those kind of things. So, so while he may disagree, he doesn't react angrily and get all upset and then you never see him again. He's the kind of person that goes away and thinks about things sincerely. He has a real sincere desire to connect to God now, I feel, and a sincere desire to become more loving in his day-to-day -day life. And so, um, yeah, I think he's just a kind of example of a lot of people that we've um, met over the last six or seven years doing seminars actually. Yeah. I feel very privileged actually to have met so many people through the course of us travelling and doing seminars who are sincerely wanting to grow themselves, mm. to be better people, to discover is God real or is God not, because not everyone who comes to our seminars has decided whether they believe in God or whether God's yeah. um, someone they even want to know. Mm. but. Uh, there is, for the majority of people who come along, a real sincerity. And I feel a, a level of humility, even to come to a lecture where um, the, the speakers are saying that they're Jesus and Mary Magdalene. <laughs> Usually that's the thing that causes most people to exit the hall rather than <laughs> to stay there. You know? <laughs> so while I think that you would have found everyone that you spoke to doesn't feel that they've necessarily resolved who we are uh, they are still willing to experiment with what we teach and see if it does help them to become happier people mm. Mm. Okay. Um, I know we meant I know we spoke about it but I don't know whether or not we got it down about the importance of actually um, people believing that you are Jesus yeah did we get that down no or we didn't no, no. And I'm happy to answer okay. that because it's, yeah. Yes, it's not important that people believe I'm Jesus. It's not Im certainly not important to me. Uh, I know who I am, so I don't need everybody else telling me who I am <laughs> or, or believing that that's who I am. I, I know who I am and I'm pretty secure in that knowledge. And, and when I say pretty secure, I'm... I'm, I'm oh, sorry, that's yeah. right. You've got something on the other side. Okay. Yeah. So, I feel that the majority of people who come to our lectures are quite sincere about wanting to learn, wanting to grow, and even if they don't keep coming to our seminars, even if they strike something where they don't agree with that, for the main part, people go on their way and. Um, then there's other people who come who I feel are very much shopping for what I would classify as a cult. They want someone who's going to tell them what to do, how to live their life, give them a sense of um, perhaps approval. Sometimes they want to find someone to adore and almost <laughs> worship. And those people usually struggle in our audiences because that's really not what we're about. And in fact, um, we endorse we we encourage people to find and discover and use their own will and um, we never tell people what to do. Can you, you can hear that, hey, quite. The, uh, the old track. Yeah. That's okay. Do you want to check in? You no, 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 you finish your... He'll, uh, he'll, he'll stop in a minute. He's just driving out. Yeah. There he is. There he is. Uh, you never tell, tell people what to do. Oh, yes, yeah. So if you wind back a little Yeah. We don't ever tell people what to do. We advocate them finding and using their own will, which is a beautiful gift that God's given us, and it's really part of the main reason we're here on earth is to learn to understand that we have a will that we can use in a loving direction and but we expect we, people to take responsibility for their own lives y yeah we yeah. we tell them that they are responsible whether they like it or not they're <laughs> responsible for their own lives because that's the way god designed things so that we can actually learn about ourselves and the universe and also both of us find the idea of um being placed above others put on a pedestal um worshipped in any way or given any special treatment we both find that very 
almost repulsive. Mm. We don't. We feel very much an equal to everyone else, and um, I know certainly for yourself, you're very firm. I don't necessarily receive those kind of feelings from others, but at times in the past, I've observed people attempt to give you that kind of treatment or feelings, and you're very firm about yeah. telling the truth that you're just a brother to everyone, and there's no need. To. And in fact, I, it distresses me a lot when people try to treat us in ways they wouldn't treat others. So in a, in a positive sense, in a sense that no, some people would give us a gift that they wouldn't give another person. And I'm going, hang on a sec, this is really off. You know, if you won't give that gift and that quality of a gift to another person, then why are you giving it to me? It's only for some addiction that's being met for you in doing that. So I feel that how a person treats the least of any, what they view as the least person on the planet is how they treat me. That, and if they don't treat me the same way, then it means they're being insincere. And, I, I, and I, I'm not too uh, crazy about people who are insincere. Yeah. And uh, as I was saying, you know, there are these types of people who come to our seminars. But obviously, as you've observed, we don't charge anything for seminars. They're open to the public. Anyone can come. And we people as they arrive. Most people, we don't know... We don't know them beforehand, especially if we're in a new location. And so we don't ever try to control who's in the audience. We feel that they're there, and because they're there, they have the opportunity to learn something if they want to. But, um, yeah, we don't even control who comes, oh. how they behave. We just The only thing would be that we would remove someone if they were being unkind to others or unkind to us. Mm. Yes, a lot of people don't understand the reasons why they are looking for a specific type of charismatic leader, I suppose. And I feel a lot of it's about the kind of emotions that they have inside of them from their childhood that causes them to seek such a person. And they believe that because I'm claiming that I'm Jesus, that it must mean that I think that I'm some kind of charismatic leader that they should follow. And that's not the case at all. That's not what I think about myself. I only am claiming that I'm Jesus because I know that I'm Jesus and that I feel that it's ethical for me to state what I know as a, as a truth to others and give them the right to make a choice based on what I'm saying. That's the only reason why I say to people, look, I am Jesus. Whether a person sticks around and listens to me after that oftentimes is determined by their either their openness, you know, their willingness to have some open mind and an open heart, or their desire for me to be something they think I should be. And the people who desire me to be something they think I should be, sooner or later have a lot of difficulty with Mary and I, because we're always breaking their uh, mould of what we should be. And sooner or later those kind of people generally leave our seminars and become very disappointed because they're always trying to expect something of us that we're never going to give, in fact. So I feel if people come along with an open mind and an open heart, um, it doesn't matter whether they believe us or not, uh, I feel, um, then I'm happy to spend time with them and talk to them about the, what, what we know to be God's truth. And I'm also happy to give them my personal opinion if they ask for it. But but for people who um, are coming along for some ulterior motive, either to either attack us or to sort of worship us in any way or, you know, or do it because it makes them feel better somehow, sooner or later those kind of people will leave. Sooner or later they, they, will, they will get tired of what we're teaching because what we're teaching confronts all of those kind of emotions. Yeah. Well, when, you, when, you, when you're talking about addiction, mm -hmm. what, you What's an addiction? what is an addiction? What's yeah. an addiction? I don't know who you went. <laughs> <laughs> no, we can answer that easily, can't we? In a few sentences, really. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. Um, most people on earth would believe that an addiction is always physical in its nature. In other words, you know, drinking alcohol too much and getting drunk every night, that's an addiction. Or, you know, t shooting up drugs, that's an addiction. Or, uh, you know, having lots and lots of sex with lots of different people and being promiscuous all the time, that's an addiction. But the reality is that we call those physical addictions and the reality is also that it's the emotional addictions on the planet that are even worse generally than the physical addictions. The thing about a physical addiction is that you can see it. You know that the person who 
has the addiction has the addiction. Or, and, and even if they don't know themselves, then everyone around them does. The problem with emotional addictions is those are a lot harder to determine. So let's define an emotional addiction. An emotional addiction is me using something that I want from you emotionally in order to cover over a fear that I have inside of myself that I'm unwilling to experience. So in other words, I'm trying to get a feeling from you that if you didn't give it to me, I would either feel angry or upset that you didn't give it to me, or I'd feel disappointed with you that you didn't give it to me, or I'd feel like, oh, I'll just go to another person who will give me that and, and forget about you altogether. And these kind of addictions are insidious because since they are emotional, most people sort of accept them as, as okay. You know, they're better than a physical addiction is what most people think. Whereas we feel that these are the kinds of addictions that prevent good relationships. They're the kinds of uh, addictions that prevent a relationship with God. They're the kind of addictions that prevent you from truly seeing yourself. So if I can give maybe an example. Um, let's say in my childhood I had a, a, a father that was not, you know, I was, my birth father was not present in my life. He, uh, he never gave me any approval. And I grew, grew up feeling and missing my uh, approval of the father figure let's say that's what's happened as an adult i'm going to have an addiction to try to find men around me who will give me approval so i might do things for them in the hope that they will give me some sense of approval some sense of self-worth when they don't i get angry with them and when they do they're my mate or my friend but i'm always doing things not out of love i'm not doing them out of a pure desire i'm doing them to get the approval that's an addiction that's an example of a person who's unwilling to feel that their father wasn't present, wasn't unwilling to have a good cry about it, unwilling to let it go. When the person has a good cry about it and lets it go, a good cry about the fact that their father wasn't present and that he didn't give her, them any approval, and they let that go, they won't go around doing things for men just to get their addiction met. They will do things for all people, men and women, because they wish to give a gift of themselves to the person, not for any other reason. That's in harmony with pure love. That's more in harmony with God's love. But we see a lot of the interactions on the planet are actually completely out of harmony with love, as God defines it, and completely in harmony, you know, in agreement with, um, you do something for me, I do something for you. Here in Australia we have this saying, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, right? <laughs> and that's how many people see their lives, you know. If you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. We'll be mates while you're scratching my back and I'm scratching yours. But as soon as one of us decides we want to go and do something different, we're no longer friends and we're no longer acquaintances and we no longer love each other and we no longer give each other gifts. And we feel that a real gift is giving somebody a gift that you don't get anything in return for, really, and that you don't have any expectation of anything in return. And that's an indication of whether you're loving or not in that moment. Whereas what we see happening for a lot of people is this strong desire that they have to only do things while the other person's doing something for them. And as soon as the other person doesn't meet their expectation, then that's it. That's the end of the arrangement. It's, it's a, like a bartering system, really. And we see the barter system works very well on the planet, it seems to but it's not based on love. And, and certainly in the higher spheres of the spirit world, um, the barter system disappears in preference to the gifting system, <laughs> which is giving another person a gift without an expectation of anything in return. So that's what we're encouraging people to do when it comes to addictions. Yeah. If we consider that an addiction is anything that we use... Uh, or do you it want to take a shot of the turkey the as turkey. I go? Yeah. I might quickly. Yeah. <laughs> it's getting from my bag. <laughs> That's called a brush turkey. Brush turkey. Yeah, they're native to Australia. My dad has this joke. He always says, those bush turkeys, you can eat them. You just get a stone, you put it in a pot of boiling water, you put the turkey in, you boil it till the stone's off, take the turkey out, eat the stone. <laughs> <laughs> eggs and she just ticks off and the male maintains the temperature of the mound and brings up all the chicks yeah so that's a male do you want to scoot that way because i'm going to scoot 
Yeah, yeah. It's going to be okay? Or yeah, that's no, fine. Are you guys getting hungry? Not, Not yet. Really. No. Not yet. Yeah. Yeah. Are you getting hungry? Okay. Yeah. Kind of lose your, lose your inspiration. Right? Yeah, I know. We have to stop the flow, haven't we? Yeah. That's yeah. all right. That's I'll why just... in our interviews and stuff we never do it. We yeah, we stop. don't cut. We just go... Tr yeah, tr it, tr it does break it. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay. You can think about an addiction as something that involves, or anything that involves, using a, a substance or an emotion to avoid some fear or pain inside of us. So commonly on the earth we're used to regarding things like alcoholism and excessive use of drugs as addictions. But many of us use other tactics, if you like, or other devices emotionally to avoid our pain and fear. So some of us a lot of us women like to have control we like to have control of our environment in our relationships and that helps us to avoid feelings of pain and fear that we're holding on to from the past other people have addictions to attention which helps them avoid feeling feelings of loneliness that they haven't let go of from their past other people have addictions to look there are many any time we use an emotion uh, an emotional interaction or an interaction with another to to receive an emotion that is not already residing within us a pleasant emotion which is not already residing within us we're actually in a state of addiction with that person and what we teach people is that it's possible to have these pleasant and secure emotions within us if we're willing to take initiative ourselves and heal ourselves emotionally and that means actually stepping back from those emotional addictions and saying Actually, I'm not going to be. I'm not going to control my environment, or I'm not going to do things for attention and glory. I'm actually going to need to deal with the pain from my past, and when I do, I'm going to feel like a, a happy, secure person for myself. Yeah, I think that. I think that's the, uh, you know, we see them sometimes, but we don't see them very frequently. You know, that's the kind of comments that we often get from yeah. spirits and who are young children in particular. And if they've died from some illness that's child that's child related, generally it means that they've had a spirit overcloaking caused by some emotion in their parents. And so they go, yeah, that spirit left me, you know, uh, when I die, you know. So so I'm good now, you know. Like I, I got no problems now, and I, I've been, I, 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 you know, I, I spend all this time now with some mates of mine, and we build these things, you know, and and. If they progress beyond the first dimension, and I've spoken to some children who progress beyond the fifth, uh, who are still children, and they go, oh yeah, you should see what we made the other day. This We made this great big circus type thing. It was all out of living things, and, and you could slide around here and go down there. And do, you know, they're describing all these <laughs> amazing things, and some of them have met their soulmates and everything by that stage. And, it, yeah. and they're, pretty, they're pretty lively kids, aren't they? They are. Yeah. And, and then when you ask them about their earth life, they go, yeah, oh, yeah, I don't go back there much anymore. You know, like, when mum and dad come to the spirit world, I'll visit them then, you know, like, <laughs> that's the way they see it. Because there's the um, cot death, isn't there? Yeah. Which is, you can't explain. There's no, they don't actually, what well, science doesn't know why, why that happens. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of it happens through an interaction of parental emotions with spirits causing the child in the sleep state to not want to come back to its body and so the child doesn't and so when the body is when the issue the issue with the body is if you if you wake up the body and the person doesn't want to come back to the body there, there's an instant severing of the connection between the physical body and the spirit body and so there's death as a result and that's how like a lot of elderly people die in their sleep and stuff yeah. that bush turkey just haven't got someone's bag so this doesn't take any technology. You might eat technology if yeah. it's small enough, so just watch yeah. that. Yeah. But it's beautiful the provisions, hey, that God's made for kids who pass, you know, they don't, they don't have the That's same. the thing where I like to give down the provisions. Yeah. They have beautiful I don't people with spirits look terrified of yeah, yeah. their kids going hell. Yeah. <laughs> that would be funny if we all had Yeah. Okay. Yeah.